First of all, what is semiotics? Right, um, semiotics is um, well uh, an approach to um, text analysis that studies how uh, studies the very nature of science, their importance and um, how significant they are in our ability to make sense of the world. So as here you have a quote from Umberto Eco, who claims that um, um, semiotics is concerned with everything that can be taken as a sign. A sign is everything which can be taken significantly substituting for something else. So semiotics is in principle the discipline studying everything which can be used in order to lie. If something cannot be used to tell a lie, conversely, it cannot be, uh, it cannot be used to tell uh, at all. Uh, well, he relates uh, semiotics and science to lying. So anything that uh, has a meaning, and we can uh, um, kind of get this meaning. Uh, is uh, the subject matter of uh, semiotics. And uh, according to this approach, according to this uh, branch of science, we, again, I will repeat once again, this um, uh, statement that we do not know the world uh, as it is. Uh, we know the world through science uh, and we, so our knowledge of the world is mediated. Uh, I will give this example later on, but for instance, how do we know that we are ill? Because we have these signs of illness. It may be high temperature, runny nose, sore throat, etc. Right? So we know about something because we detect signs of this something. But for, for instance, um, uh, high temperature may be uh, at times, it may be not a um, sign of illness, but some people, for instance, experience this phenomenon when they are extremely excited, especially children. They may feel, you know, they may get this uh, high temperature because of being kind of over, uh, too, uh, worked up too much. Uh, therefore, um, uh, we can say that our knowledge of the world is not so much the knowledge of the world, but our interpretation of science. Um, and um, when we talk about semiotics, um, so its scope is extremely uh, broad because science may be actually anything. We have words, they are signs. We also have, um, um, for instance, road signs, and they are also uh, the subject matter of semiotics. Uh, therefore, um, we can say that kind of um, semiotics offers us an approach or a methodology, how to um, uh, to study science, um, because as I said, the subject matter is too diverse and too kind of complex. Uh, therefore, the task of the semiotics is to offer a certain method that can be applicable to any system of science. Uh, just uh, therefore, it is kind of a very abstract uh, methodol uh, methodology. Uh, if we talk about the history of semiotics as a uh, science, then uh, it appeared um, kind of simultaneous. Well, it rather uh, it uh, um, definitely uh, scholars and philosophers did study science, but as a branch, um, it uh, appeared in the 20th century. And uh, we can say that it appeared more or less simultaneously uh, in two different parts of the world, in Switzerland and in the United States. 
So in Switzerland, uh, semiotics is related to uh, to Ferdinand de Saussure, right? And uh, um, he uh, uh, was a linguist who uh, taught at the, the University of Geneva. Uh, and uh, uh, the um, collection of his lectures uh, was published posthumously uh, in uh, 1915 by his students. And it was titled Course in General Linguistics. Uh, which again <laughs> is kind of ironic because since um, uh, as some scholars joke that since it was uh, um, compiled of the notes of students who knows what uh, Ferdinand de Saussure uh, taught in reality so it is again interpretation kind of yes because notes are not exactly the same thing as a lecture uh, given by the professor but anyway uh, we know about the theory uh, suggested by Ferdinand de Saussure from the notes his uh, students made. And uh, during, at his lectures, he suggested a new science. At that time, uh, he called it semiology. Well, now we call it uh, semiotics. And he um, suggests this science, and he believed that semiology would show what constitutes science, what laws govern them. And he claimed that uh, linguistics is only part of this general science, semiology. Um, because uh, the, what is true for, for, for a linguistic sign is also true for any sign in any, sy in any system we can take. Uh, road signs, we can take, for instance, um, clothes or actually cuisine, yes, and what, for instance, food that we have uh, on the table. Uh, it also can, can be meaningful because if you compare, for instance, uh, Christmas, a Christmas table and an Easter table, you immediately understand which one is which because there are like symbol, like symbolic yes, and peculiar uh, dishes that are signs of a certain period, of a certain holiday. Uh, so, for as we see, semiology for uh, Ferdinand de Saussure was uh, again this very abstract uh, approach, abstract science that uh, studies uh, uh, science in general in uh, any um, in any uh, uh, semiotic system. Uh, what? is uh, relevant for us uh, when we talk about uh, science. So according to the Saussure, yeah, he, he claimed that uh, what constitutes a sign. So according to Saussure, um, a sign uh, is constituted of a signifier that is uh, uh, a word Mm, like a form and a meaning, right? And a meaning that uh, we keep kind of, or here it is mental concept, right? So uh, a certain set of phonemes stand for a certain, uh, a certain sign, uh, yeah, a certain sign, or make up a certain sign, sorry. Uh, be considered a sign. Uh, also, Ferdinand de Saussure claimed that uh, here we have an apple, yes, so some uh, signs have, um, oh, some signs are uh, referential uh, in that they have reference in the real world. Here we can talk about apples, about any objects. Uh, but, uh, for instance, according to Saussure, some signs do not have uh, a reference in the, um, 
in, uh, we cannot point our finger at a certain uh, reference when we talk about abstract nouns such as love or hate or friendship. Uh, and uh, moreover, uh, we have some kind of uh, uh, common nouns. Uh, they are not abstract. They are class nouns, like for instance, angels uh, or unicorns. Um, uh, and though they are kind of uh, class nouns, but there are no um, reference uh, of these um, uh, nouns in the real world, but for us, kind of, we uh, can, we assume that they exist in some other possible world. Uh, another uh, point made by Sassur uh, about language science uh, is that uh, language signs are arbitrary. So people just uh, agree to call a certain object uh, with a certain set of phonemes. We don't know why a dog is called a dog in English and why uh, it is sub sobaka in Ukrainian. It's just because, right? So he claimed that most uh, language signs are uh, unmotivated. We don't know the reason why this set of phonemes was chosen for this particular uh, sign. Uh, yet, we can say that uh, some words are motivated. For instance, we have uh, onomatopoeia, right? So imitation. For instance, uh, to buzz uh, in English um, is kind of motivated because bees buzz and this verb buzz, buzzing, um, uh, resembles uh, the uh, noise uh, emitted by bees. Yet, we can say that these uh, kind of on onomatopoeic words are motivated only within a certain sign system, within a certain language community. Because in Ukrainian, for instance, bees are uh, uh, yeah, so this is also an uh, onomatopoeic word, but it is different. Therefore, uh, the main claim is that uh, arbitrariness is the main uh, feature of, uh, of language science. Uh, and uh, um, Ferdinand de Saussure also um, uh, used uh, the term symbol, uh, but in a very peculiar way, he claimed that symbols um, maintain a metaphoric relation with the signified. For instance, uh, um, uh, skull over two crossed bones for piracy or danger. Um, then, uh, for instance, a snake uh, and um, like this medical cup for chemistry or pharmaceutics and so on. So there is a metaphoric uh, relation and this is a feature of symbols. Uh, I said that semiotics kind of originated as a, or be, uh, you know, got sanctioned as a science in two parts of the world. So Ferdinand de Saussure um, uh, worked in Switzerland. Uh, there was another um, researcher, a philosopher of language, Charles Sanders Peirce. Uh, he also uh, started um, the way uh, people perceive the world and how they kind of um, relay, how they um, create uh, this the mediated reality uh, in their mind. And he claimed that uh, actually, uh, 
uh, sign is uh, something uh, that stands to somebody for something in some respect or capacity. So uh, a sign is something that stands between uh, something uh, to somebody. And they gave you an example of temperature. Yeah? So temperature stands between us and illness that it is a symptom of. Um, So here we have, um, uh, for instance, an object. Yes, this is the actual thing to which um, the sign refers. Interpretant is the sense made of this sign. And um, referent is within uh, Charles Sanders Peirce's um, inter interpretation or theory is the form which a sign takes. And uh, on the basis of this uh, scheme, um, Peirce differentiated between three types of signs. The first type is an icon. Uh, the relationship uh, between a, a sign and an object is a resemblance or similarity. For instance, our photos are our icons because they resemble us very much. Uh, the other, the second type is an index. The relationship between um, a um, kind of a sign and uh, uh, well, an index sign and uh, the object it stands for uh, is cause and consequence. As I said, uh, like temperature, temperature and uh, uh, illness, so temperature is a, an index of illness. Just like smoke is an index of fire. Uh, like, uh, for instance, we always uh, detect uh, professional dancers and military officers because, or sports, uh, sports people because of the way they move. Right, so the uh, movements uh, are the in uh, indexes or uh, yeah indexes of the uh, profession, and the uh, third type of uh, signs is symbols. Uh, the relationship here is random. So for um, in this case. Mm, we can say that uh, language is symbolic for, uh, for Peirce, just like uh, Sur, he believes that uh, the meanings of words are the results of, consen uh, of yeah, the results of consensus. We agreed, yes, to call a dog a dog, and that's it. Uh, and again, he uh, claims that, um, this, that symbols consolidate society. Uh, if we share the same symbols, uh, then we kind of we identify we identify um, ourselves with this um, particular group, and also we kind of differentiate between insiders and outsiders uh, with the help of symbols. Insiders use the same symbols with the same meanings. Outsiders. Uh, either do not know these symbols or they invest them with uh, some other meanings. Um, so uh, if we kind of cut this long sh story short, then we can say that semiotics 
uh, helps to increase awareness of the fact that we know the world by means of science, whether these are verbal or sensory. As well as having material form, reality also has a semiotic existence. How we perceive objects, ideas, or other people, and the meanings we attribute to them are greatly influenced by the way these are represented and the medium through which they are represented. Uh, for instance, uh, we can talk about communication, um, kind of uh, our, for instance, uh, a breakup one thing is when a person break, uh, breaks up with, for instance, a partner via, say, texting on, for instance, tele, uh, on Telegram or personally, or just uh, this person stops answering. So all these things, all these actions uh, are significant. They are signs they, they are certain message and the medium, right? Uh, also matters when, for instance, uh, somebody just texts, uh, it means, uh, well, I guess it is something like an insult, but uh, like the talking um, face to face uh, delivers more clarity, more courage and more uh, makes this well, at least shows that uh, this act means something to the person. So uh, the medium matters and uh, the form matters as well. And if we talk about uh, the notions of semiotics, then uh, we probably will talk about connotation, um, uh, denotation, um, these are um, the, uh, the main, probably syntag syntagment paradigm. So uh, if we talk about, let's start with uh, denotation. So denotation is the uh, primary meaning, right? Uh, these terms uh, in general, uh, connotation and uh, denotation uh, were suggested by Roland Barthes. Uh, and um, uh, he understood denotation as uh, primary meaning uh, of a word, uh, of a sign and a word uh, respectively. Uh, it's exact meaning. So for instance, when we talk about uh, a rose, what we mean denotation is uh, a red rose. Denotation is red flower of a certain type, of a certain species. Uh, yet, uh, this, um, uh, this uh, very kind of sign may have uh, uh, connotations. It may be a sign of love and uh, actually very passionate love. Um, uh, and we can say that connotations may be used as, uh, as used as uh, rhetorical devices. Uh, for instance, uh, metaphors and uh, met metonymies. Uh, for instance, um, when we talk about uh, a dollar, right? It may be also uh, not only like literally. Uh, the U.S. currency, but it may also uh, the kind of uh, the connotation may be wealth. Uh, if we talk about and it and connotations are those uh, like secondary meanings that make um, um, make synonyms different because we have. Uh, such words as famous and notorious. In both cases, it's, it means that a person is well known, but famous implies positive image, like positive, good fame. Uh, and notoriety, notorious, is uh, uh, being famous, being well known for something bad, so bad reputation. The same when we say uh, that the person is eccentric, 
and for instance, the person is a misfit. Yeah, so eccentric is neutral, just special, not like others, but misfit implies some maladaptability uh, to the society. Uh, also, we can say that uh, connotations are very much context dependent. For instance, um, if we talk about uh, American English, then there is a word nigger, which is uh, kind of, which has negative connotations and associated with racial discrimination. Yet, uh, if you are a white person, and if you use this word uh, to refer to uh, African Americans, it is insulting, but African Americans may use this word to refer to each other, and it has no con negative connotations. It's just it may be used as just a colloquial or jocular or something like that. So again, here we deal with pragmatics. Words start to mean something uh, depending on uh, on the context on the speaker uh, and you very often you you need a broader context to understand why this for instance word is used and what it means um, then uh, if we talk about uh, syntagm and paradigm then when we talk about syntagm then we uh, discuss the uh, linear relationship in a sequence of um, of certain uh, kind of uh, of certain signs uh, here we have a sentence but then we can for instance discuss we will discuss some uh, images and also for instance an image may have a certain or well, uh, a certain text uh, may consist of several signs and uh, some signs, uh, and, and these signs may deliver several ideas. So these several ideas are a syntax, they are linear, like in a sequence, for instance, you can order them. But each, each idea may be uh, uh, represented or expressed by several images. And in this case, if one idea uh, uni uh, unites several uh, images, they create paradigm. So here, well, in, uh, in uh, linguistics, it is uh, easy to show that syntax is the man, for instance, jumped into the house. Here we have the syntax, each, uh, each kind of uh, word stands for, for something and they are united in, in a sentence, something bigger. They create uh, a certain message. Uh, and paradigm is all the possible words that can be, that can replace one a particular word in a syntagm. For instance, if we talk about the predicate, it can be walked, stormed, ran, jumped, crashed, broke, etc. If we take into it, will be out of, for instance, round, past, and so on. Yeah, so any um, preposition that makes sense in this sentence. Mm, uh, these the, uh, these uh, similar. Um, elements in a syntax that can be put into a syntax make up a paradigm. Uh, then um, in synotics there were several uh, schools. For instance, we have the Parisian school of semiotics and um, they also suggested their own classification of um, uh, signs. Within this classification, um, uh, we can talk about a theme. Uh, a theme is a sign that has a non-physical signified. In this case, we, for instance, if we talk about language sign that uh, signs, then these are abstract nouns, for instance. Uh, 
uh, and figures, on the other hand, are those signs that have material signified. So usually these are uh, words that refer to some objects in the real or possible wor uh, wor worlds. Uh, and we can say that figures can be used to explain themes and themes can be used to explain figures. Uh, why is it um, uh, why is it uh, in, can why can it be useful? Uh, because um, mm, uh, we it, it may help us to understand how texts are organized. And this um, uh, like kind of uh, uh, correlation between a type of a text, and uh, the symbols uh, they contain. For instance, if we analyze uh, children's books, they are made up of figures. Children tend to think in terms of kind of very concrete objects, right? Uh, and uh, themes practically never occur in such texts. At the same time, uh, various academic works nowadays uh, like predo are predominantly filled with themes, with terms. They uh, usually refer to some abstract ideas. And this, uh, this is, so we can analyze uh, uh, like modern uh, types of text, but we can also uh, we conduct culture-specific culture uh, studies. And we can, for instance, say that some words, some uh, languages are primitive because they don't offer any names for some, or any equivalents for some abstract nouns in, say, English. Uh, that's why we can even go further and make a, race, a racist statement that probably these people uh, are also kind of not so much advanced in their mental abilities. Uh, there are also studies that uh, kind of prove uh, that um, this ability to think uh, in an abstract way and to operate with abstract notions uh, is um, kind of, uh, or it took time uh, to develop in uh, Western languages and Western culture. Uh, there, uh, there were studies of uh, um, uh, titles of academic works starting from the Middle Ages up to the modern times, and uh, it is quite uh, expected, and this is what they found out, that uh, medieval um, treaties were f the, the titles the, were quite concrete. For instance, how to make I don't know, uh, to turn, I don't know, iron into gold. An iron coin into a gold, a gold coin, and, it's, and so on. Now you open, for instance, you Google anything uh, on chemistry and you understand that uh, it's all terms, it's not the names of elements, it's the names of processes, and these are uh, abstract terms. So, um, therefore, such an approach helps us to, um, to um, kind of, to compare genres and types of texts and also to uh, understand how human thought uh, is formed. Uh, again, to disprove uh, all these uh, ra racist theories, we can say that uh, people who uh, you know, uh, who speak these um, exotic languages, exotic for us, uh, they learn, um, or they acquire um, abstract, and they learn abstract, uh, uh, abstract words and they start operating themes pretty fast. Uh, why they don't operate, why do they don't have uh, these uh, uh, words and notions uh, and signs in their languages is because their life is uh, different and they just don't need, uh, for instance, a word for, uh, for, uh, for eyesight. But they have a very complicated um, vocabulary, a very kind of 
diverse vocabulary to uh, and there for instance uh, there is a word that means an eye of a human being an eye of uh, an animal an eye of a bird also for instance there are verbs that denote uh, to kill an animal to kill a bird uh, and so on so they have just their own needs and their environment, their lifestyle requires different, uh, kind of, uh, different structure of vocabulary. Uh, and of course, when we talk about uh, semiotic signs and uh, uh, knowledge, in, we inevitably uh, uh, come to the name of uh, Yulia Kristeva and her notion of intertextuality. So, um, uh, Kristeva suggested this term to describe uh, the borrowing by a text of content or stylistic features that were present in a previously produced text. So, according to her, uh, kind of we um, uh, we as human beings uh, live in a, um, live surrounded by different texts and our knowledge of the world uh, what we think what we write about what we talk about uh, is uh, full of and draws on uh, the um, the content of all these uh, uh, sources that we have uh, come across before. Uh, so we are kind of all this knowledge, all these texts are woven into our uh, mind and our thought. That's why whatever we create. Uh, is intertextual. It echoes with what we have, what other people have already written uh, or said or experienced and uh, talked about. Therefore, um, they, and this actually opened up the door for postmodernism, the idea that nothing is uh, uh, original, nothing is 100% uh, uh, new. Uh, whatever is created uh, is rooted in the previous experience and the previous works. Everything is intertextual and our knowledge of reality is also intertextual, just because we cannot kind of experienced and gained this all this knowledge firsthand. Uh, so if we talk about semiotics, then if I say that this uh, advertisement is uh, intertextual, is it? So, uh, first of all, we have a uh, cheeseburger in the shape of uh, an apple uh, bitten by somebody, which uh, in turn is a kind of lo a symbol logo of uh, the Apple company and actually an apple itself. And this just apple is a symbol of what? Or, but why? Why was it chosen by the uh, by Apple Company? What does it stand for? Where did they the take apple this? Apple of knowledge, maybe. Yeah. So biblical. So everything is very much intertextual and we kind of, we decipher it even without thinking of it. But here we have uh, the Bible, the Apple company and uh, McDonald's, right? Uh, and it is uh, not only uh, 
kind of visualized, but also we have here this Big Mac. Mac may be Macintosh or Mac may be McDonald's, right? Uh, therefore, again, uh, very much uh, inter, uh, intertextual, yes, and this intertextuality permeates both the image and the uh, verbal kind of accompanying uh, uh, not slogan, but uh, uh, content, okay, element, let's put it like that. What about this? You see, I'm full of apples. Apple, uh, how to put it, uh, symbols. What do you see here? How is it intertextual and what signs do you see? So first of all, what, what is advertised? Perfume. Mm -hmm. How is it advertised? What are the qualities of this perfume? Mm, Probably not. Delicious. Come to delicious. Mm -hmm. Then maybe some sort of adventures because we have take a bite out of life which means like the adventures feel life to the fullest. Yeah, in this, case, in this case, what is life? It has connotations, it's not biological life. Right? Maybe, yeah. <laughs> it's not biological, just... Life as a, a, some adventure, some excitement, some maybe even extreme experience judging uh, judging from the way she looks at us <laughs> obviously something exciting right uh, and something adventurous so we in this slogan we have this connotation because life may be biological and maybe kind of social when you experience something extraordinary so they capitalize also on this um and on this connotation okay Mm -hmm. So excitement. If we if we uh, if we talk about um, the paradigm, so excitement. Here we have life, right? One means that expresses this uh, idea. Then I mentioned already the way she looks, and she looks kind of savagely at us. Okay. Uh, any any other exciting things? Yeah, this is actually what the uh, bottle of this perfume looks like. Yes, and we have here the, uh, the reflection of this uh, New York skyline. And New York is kind of uh, a, um, like uh, the symbol of some exciting life, right? Life, not biological. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, anything else? If we talk about this apple theme, what else, what, what, uh, what are these stories that stand behind? Yeah, and we have her here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, so uh, Eve, uh, who uh, bit of uh, this forbidden fruit, which we believe was an apple. Okay, anything else? Snow White. <laughs> really? Sorry, just, just, well, apples and Snow White, that's quite connected. I mean. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, this is, I don't know why, uh, but what I know for sure, what is... Uh, uh, what is the uh, kind of nickname uh, of New York? Ah, the Big Apple. The Big Apple. Yeah, so they play with this idea of New York. Uh, they correlate it with the Bible, uh, with the biblical apple. Yeah, and again, um, they kind of uh, uh, link the two together. 
in with the help of this perfume. Uh, okay. So again, a lot of things that bring us to this uh, uh, complexity of this advertisement. Of course, again, everything like all these connotations are in the eye of beholder, right? Because many people just catch one. Probably the most obvious is this Eve and apples, but uh, there are more. Uh, maybe mm, mm, many people are not aware of them, but still this, uh, we recognize the New York um, sky and so on, and um, we may not even know this uh, nickname of New York, but anyway, uh, the form then of the bottle helps us to kind of to remember that they are somehow connected at least in this perfume. Okay, and uh, now we turn to the um, topic of narrative. So uh, narrative is kind of uh, the way we, we perceive reality, we perceive our lives. So we kind of clay, uh, uh, Bart claimed that uh, our life uh, is in fact a story, yes, is a narrative. So uh, there are two approaches to study narratives. The first is narrative semiotics. Uh, and narrative semiotics draws on the tradition to study stories uh, in terms of characters. Uh, so here uh, we uh, talk about Vladimir Prop. He studied um, fairy tales uh, and he classified uh, in these fairy tales uh, characters' actions. And uh, he developed um, a kind of uh, a gist of all the fairy tales that uh, reads as follows. A king sends a hero on a quest that will solve a problem or uh, bring back something for the king. The hero performs certain acts that usually involve breaking a rule being punished, being deceived by someone, meeting someone who helps him, and finally returning to the king, having accomplished the aim. His reward to be the head of uh, the hand of a princess and or ascension to the throne. throne. So uh, Prop found 31 uh, functions that are present in these stories. Um, again, if I talk a little bit uh, like if we kind of jump into the mass communication, we will see that the same plot uh, is acted out in political discourse, where politicians, for instance, uh, candidates for presidency are heroes, and they are pictured in their campaigns as people who are capable of solving problems of the people. Yes, and here the kind of uh, those who gain something will be people first. And of course, this uh, person who will kind of uh, overcome problems, fight with opponents, uh, and um, uh, as, as a result, uh, uh, creates the conditions for equality, prosperity, and justice. Uh, mm, there within uh, narrative semiotics, we also may talk about the Paris School. Uh, and uh, within the Paris School, uh, we can, mm, uh, well, it is kind of uh, relevant to talk about models. So Paris School tried to create models of um, uh, uh, of stories. 
the firm uh, the first model uh, is based on um, uh, on actors or on participants and it also resembles very much um, uh, the theory um, suggested by probe so uh, within the actential model we have the following plot someone the sender sends another the subject to perform a series of actions in order to obtain something of value object the subject will be helped by someone the helper and obstructed by someone the opponent from the acquisition of the object someone will benefit and this beneficiary will be the receiver you take any blockbuster, any action movie, and you will find all of these there with the um, kind of psychological uh, films or psychological uh, literary works. Things are more complicated because, for instance, uh, opponents may be not... Uh, someone but something it may be some phobia fear some uh, probably biases etc but in general uh, this is uh, the, uh, the, the this is a set of characters that can be um, found uh, in most narratives um, and uh, well, we can also say that between uh, these components, uh, there are certain relations. For instance, between the sender and the subject, uh, it is a contract. For instance, uh, if the sender is kind of people and the subject is a politician, then kind of people uh, uh, vote and there is a contract between this newly elected uh, president and people, right? The relation between uh, subject and object is a struggle, yeah, because people struggle, like the, polit the politician, the president struggles for justice. And uh, between the sender and the receiver is communication, but uh, here the receiver, if we talk about politics, the sender and the receiver are actually the same. Uh, if we talk about conspiracy theories, then probably the senders will be uh, not people, not voters, but those who um, kind of who, um, uh, finance this politician. But we will not go so far so definitely there is communication between those between the sponsors and the sponsored uh, and there is a second uh, model within uh, paris school um, it is called narrative trajectory it's not about who it's about the sequence of events so um any story uh, is a sequence of certain events. Uh, it begins with the initial situation, that is the setting. Uh, in kind of ordinary books, uh, we, especially non postmodernism, non postmodern books, now there is uh, the first. Corinthians chapter is just description of who will be the main character, the circumstances, surrounding, time, and so on. You're kind of introduced into the setting. Then qualifying test. The next stage, some complication arises, right? And uh, some, and kind of puts some questions, some obstacles to be resol uh, resolved. Then decisive test. So the character starts uh, resolving this problem. As a rule, uh, resolution takes several uh, tries. And the last stage of a narrative uh, is glorifying test. So the problem has been resolved. 
if it hasn't been resolved and if it is a movie, especially if it is a movie, then we have a sequel, right? So it means that there will be some uh, next parts of this, uh, of this film. Uh, and again, here we can say that uh, any kind of stage of our life can be told uh, as uh, or, and can be analyzed in terms of, of uh, narrative trajectory. If, for instance, when you graduate, your graduation is the initial situation. You start looking for a job. So you study the vacancies. You send your CV, you go to interviews. These are your decisive tests. And the glorifying test, you have finally found a job and this is your first day of employment. And this is, you, you tell your love story the same. You tell, for instance, uh, uh, the story of your children is the same, right? Um, so it's kind of universal. Uh, but here uh, we should speak also not only about narrative semiotics, but also about the other, the second approach to uh, study um, narratives. Narrative semiotics tried to kind of uh, deconstruct, yes, so do, kind of to analyze the, the structure, who and in what sequence uh, na uh, narratology approaches narratives differently. It's not about what is told, but how it is told. Uh, for instance, um, especially in uh, postmodernism, uh, it is uh, there are many ways to tell the same story. Uh, French film director Godard said that uh, I like a film to have a beginning, a middle, and an end, but not necessarily in that order, right? So uh, in postmodernism in particular, uh, a certain kind of narrative or a narrator may choose to start the story from the end. You, the first that you see or the first that you read about is a funeral, and then you are told how the main character kind of got to this point of his existence, right? When he's, he's been or she's been buried. Uh, and in this case, we can say that we may analyze. Mm, uh, or that the stories may be told in uh, a linear order. So this uh, um, narrative trajectory is followed. The person is born, goes to school, marries, has children, retires, dies. Or there may be flashbacks, uh, especially in psychological, uh, pieces of art or in psychological narratives, flashbacks or vice versa, you can jump into the future. Uh, and in such a way, the narrator helps us to understand uh, either the reasons or the causes of certain events or the consequences. So we may have glimpses of the future or glimpses of the past. Um, or uh, a narrator may play with uh, uh, kind of uh, with uh, mm, storytellers. An author can play with uh, storytellers. And if we talk about Gerard uh, Genet, then uh, he differentiates between extra diegetic, intra diegetic, hetero diegetic, and homo diegetic uh, narratives. So uh, an intra diegetic um, or an extra diegetic uh, uh, narrative uh, is a narrative where a storyteller is not a participant of a um, of this particular story. So this is the third uh, person narration. The author is outside of the whole situation and is just telling uh, as an as an uh, kind of outsider, absolute outsider. Intradiegetic 
the uh, the narrator is inside so um, is among the um, among the participants and usually these are uh, kind of uh, we can see this person among the characters but if it is a uh, intradiegetic story then it may be heterodiegetic or homodiegetic homodiegetic this is the uh, story told by a uh, by the main character and heterodiegetic is a story uh, told by um, a secondary character. It may be a friend, a spouse of the main character, and so on. So this is a, a story told by a participant, but the participant is just kind of is an insider, but not. Uh, this is not his story. And uh, it is important, actually, the um, identity of a storyteller is important because, first of all, when we, um, uh, when, uh, when we have the first person narration, then automatically we presuppose that it is maybe biased. Uh, it um, uh, may lack certain information about other people's uh, motives and thoughts. If it is third-person narration, then uh, we presuppose that the narrator knows a lot. Yes, yeah? so uh, narrator disposes of all the um, all the knowledge and kind of is quite often is unbiased and is, he's like a judge. Uh, also, if, for instance, if it is a first-person narration, if we know that the storyteller uh, is, for instance, mentally ill, of course, we kind of presuppose that we may have some distorted uh, reality in description. Uh, if we know that this person is, uh, for instance, a criminal, uh, we also have certain presuppositions and certain biases, and so on. Therefore, um, the um, identity of narrator is one of the ways to kind of to 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 influence the readers or the viewers' perception and attitude. So, and here um, the last thing that I would ask you to do uh, is to read this passage and tell me uh, whether this is an uh, uh, extra diegetic, intra diegetic, homo uh, diegetic, hetero diegetic, and actually uh, how many voices you hear in this passage. So um, the author is not the main character, so probably the story is heterodiegetic and extradiegetic because he doesn't take the part take part in the events. 
Mm, but is he present in this story? The author? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, if he's telling about his friend or something, yeah, maybe he is. Uh, if you analyze the language, for instance, when um, uh, when we read, um, first of all, what tense is this story told in? Present. What words are used, for instance, um, uh, has, uh, fountain, has, fountain has for some time now been opting to sleep here in his shop, uh, then um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, has come to regard and so on. Uh, Fontaine has been taking this price for some days now and he's taking it again today. What do you think? Does it mean all these small things? They're called, I don't know if you had it or not in your theoretical grammar. This is deictic word, words. Yeah, yeah. And these deictic words are kind of pointing at the presence. At some point that the narrator and this character share. So they both. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they, they, they share actually. the same time and place. Yeah, all so, right. Then he is intradiegetic. Like, yeah, so I mean, it is intradiegetic, yes, um, mm -hmm. because they share the same time and uh, place. Uh, what about voices? So we have the narrator, definitely, and he tells this, uh, the, tells about uh, the main character, obviously, Fantin. Any other voices? His younger wife? Yeah, Clarice. Mm -hmm. And we have here uh, direct speech. Any other voices? Well, I didn't really get the passage about dolls, if that's supposed to mean anything. Well, it, this is just the beginning of the story. The first, uh, the first passages, but yeah, this this last uh, paragraph uh, stands out because it is not related to that particular time. It's kind of uh, referential information, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we can say that this is kind of uh, I don't know, uh, just. Uh, informative yes general information about some uh, subject and it, it it is not related to the story but what about this not he will tell you a condition to aspire to who's so, who, that's Fontaine which you have whom you have mentioned here yeah so it means that uh, this is these are his words yeah but mm -hmm. though it is not a direct speech but kind of indirect right yeah, so correct. here we have here we have a narrator, Fontaine, his wife, and some uh, paragraph that stands out because it is kind of uh, narrator neutral, right? So some referential data about those, maybe they will be uh, important uh, for the story later on. Yeah, but the, the passage is short, right? But uh, there are many things uh to say and the, the the author kind of uh i can't say plays with us but uses several uh, like a range of means to kind of to change the perspectives and to add voices uh okay